Hi everyone, welcome to this mini lecture on the poem Cleopatra by Horace. Um, it's one of his odes, it's number 1.37 and it was published in 23 BC. Remember you don't have to know the name and the number but if you can I suppose that's helpful but as long as you use one or the other consistently in your essays that is the main thing. Okay so let's move on straight away. So as always it's really important to think about scholarship and I will refer back to this throughout this talk but I'll just talk through them briefly now. So the first one I want to talk about is Jenkins who points out that Horace's collection of odes wouldn't be published until 23 BC and that 15 years are a long time in revolutionary po politics. From this he argues that the poets were not useful for propaganda. Now this is a really useful scholar that you could use across any 30 mark essay where you are talking about poets because he says there he uses the word poets it doesn't just have to be about Horace and if you were arguing about success or effectiveness you could use Jenkins as a counter argument to say that actually they weren't particularly successful or effective at portraying Augustus in a particular way because uh, these poems, for instance, are published so long after the events that they're describing. Obviously, you have to be clear about the events that are being described and how long after the poem is published. So that is something to consider, but really useful as a counter argument. And then if you want to get superb level five type grades, you can engage with that by by counteracting it and saying, actually, I think they would have still been useful for propaganda because something like the Battle of Actium would have been fresh in the minds of many Roman citizens who were involved in that conflict something like that. Then we have Beard who suggests that the work they produced, this is the poets, offers a memorable and eloquent image of a new golden age for Rome and its empire with Augustus centre stage. Now this is interesting because this very much seems to be disagreeing with Jenkins by saying that they are offering a memorable and eloquent image of a golden age. So that seems to show that they're very successful at portraying Augustus as bringing peace and prosperity I think what's really interesting about Beard, as we shall see in this poem, is that a lot of the poems don't even mention Augustus by name. So to talk about him being centre stage is quite interesting. Wallace Hadrill talks specifically about Actium and it's quite useful to have references to uh, scholars who talk about Actium and what's called the myth of Actium because so much of the poetry does seem to refer to that. So he suggests that Antony is barely mentioned in Augustan poetry in the Res Gestae because the myth making of Actium, and that's quite a good quote to use in itself, the myth making of Actium required that it should be seen as a battle for Roman values to save the Roman world from an assault on its gods, its ideals and its moral fabric. So I suppose by taking Antony out of that, it's not showing a Roman citizen to be immoral. But we'll, we'll, we'll refer directly to these scholars when we look at the poem now. OK, so here we go. So I'm going to read the first verse and then we'll talk about some details. Remember, do try to make notes uh, on the poem. Try and have it in front of you. If you haven't, then perhaps pause the video, go and get a copy of the poem and a pen or just jot down some notes in front of you. OK, now's the time for drinking deep and now's the time to beat the earth with unfettered feet. The time to set out the God's sacred couches, my friends, and prepare a salient feast. So this opening verse is celebratory. We talk about drinking. The beating the earth with unfettered feet is dancing. There's religious activity by setting out the God's sacred couches. There's mention of a feast. So there's lots of language here used by Horace to create a positive image at the start of this poem. Notice, as I said before, there's no mention of Augustus or Mark Antony. This ties into a couple of different themes, doesn't it? So Cleopatra, we automatically think of the Imperator theme, but actually we could use quotes here for the culture hero theme in, in terms of bringing peace and abundance. The, the implication here is that the world is now at peace or the Rome, the Rome is now at peace. And also it, this could link to the Augustus theme because it mentions setting out the God's sacred couches and also salient is a reference to a religious uh, festival as well. So there is reference there to bringing back worship of the gods. Now is the time to do that. And the implication is perhaps, unless we, um, unless we think about what Jenkins said, but the implication here is that perhaps Augustus is responsible for that. 
He carries on. It would have been wrong before today to broach the Kaikuban wines from out the ancient bins, while a maddened queen was still plotting the capitals in the empire's room, ruin. So again, the first couple of lines, focusing on wine, again, links with celebration, the, uh, the implication that Rome has been waiting to be able to celebrate, to be at peace. And then the tone changes with words such as maddened, plotting, ruin and those words are directly related to the word queen and there's only one queen that the romans would have been thinking about here and that is cleopatra just as a note where it says capital there that isn't referring to rome the capital of italy because there was no such place as italy in those days but the capital is a hill in the middle of rome where their most respected and revered temple was to jupiter optimus maximus so what Horace is implying here is that Cleopatra wanted to sort of tear down the walls of Rome. So what we have here is if we link what we've said there to, um, to Beard, suggesting that the work offers a memorable and eloquent image of a new golden age for Rome, that golden age is shown in this celebratory language. So drinking, unfettered feet, God's couches, feast, Kai Cuban wines. Um, but what we don't have here is Augustus' centre stage. OK, here the, uh, the darker tone continues. So talking about Cleopatra with her crowd of deeply corrupted creatures, sick with turpitude, she violent with hope of all kinds and intoxicated by fortune's favour. But it calmed her frenzy. I'm just going to stop there. So. We've got this idea of crowd that has implications of a mob, um, which has an in, in, implications of, sort of chaos and not control, no order, deeply corrupted. This plays into what Wallace Hadrill was talking about. Um, is it being against Roman values and turpitude and sick builds on that image of corruption? Turpitude meaning depraved or wicked behaviour. The word creatures dehumanises them. They're almost not human beings, not like the upstanding Romans who have these Roman values. And then we have words like violence, which links directly actually with what Wallace Hadrill says about an assault uh, on its gods, its ideals and its moral fabric. And Cleopatra and her deeply corrupted creatures are very much painted by Horace here as assaulting Rome with their immorality intoxicated implies drunkenness and notice how that sort of contrasts with the mention of wine and celebration and drinking deep before but intoxicated has much more negative implications doesn't it and um, but it calmed her frenzy so this again builds on this image we have before of cleopatra being mad she is a mad woman she's not a controlled ordered queen which is very much the picture we get in the historical sources but she is mad and uncontrollable and chaotic but it calms her frenzy that scarcely a single ship escaped the flames and caesar reduced the distracted thoughts bred by mariotic wine to true fear pursuing her close as she fled from rome okay notice here we have the mention of Caesar straight away. So we've got Augustus. He is mentioned here. No mention of Antony yet, though, is there? And now we have more military imagery. So this idea that scarcely a single ship escaped the flames shows the power of Augustus. So Augustus Caesar is in the centre of this verse and he's reducing um, to true fear. He's reducing the distracted thoughts. He's pursuing um, as she fled. So there's lots of imagery and language here which implies his power and his military force, I suppose, here. And uh, remember here, as she fled from Rome, that's not talking about the city of Rome, it's talking about the army of Rome, everything that represents Rome, all the Roman values that are basically overcoming her un-Roman values, her distracted thoughts her drunkenness. Again, we have this mariotic wine and that very much contrasts with the Kaikuban wine that we saw before. So she's very much seen as a weaker creature here and very much in opposition to the stoic values of the Roman world that Wallace Hadrill talks about. And we are getting more war imagery here. Again, the dehumanising continues in this verse. 
out to capture that deadly monster, bind her as the sparrow hawk follows the gentle dove or the swift hunter chases the hare over the snowy plains of Thessaly. So here the image becomes a little bit more confusing. So we have deadly monster in that opening line there, but then we have more sympathetic imagery that Horace is using. So he uses a simile to get this across. So as the sparrow hawk follows the gentle dove, so Augustus is the sparrow hawk, Cleopatra is the gentle dove. That's confusing, isn't it? Augustus is the swift hunter, Cleopatra is the hare. Over the snowy plains of Thessaly, again, this very natural imagery in lots of contrast to those previous verses. And this is part of the wonder of Horace because maybe this shows some subversion and some sympathy for Cleopatra. Maybe it shows an awareness of the fact that she is a victim rather than an aggressor. Maybe it's just the sort of wonder of his poetry. Remember, poets are there to entertain. They're there to provoke thought just as they are nowadays. And this is a really good example of Horace doing that. So it's OK in an essay to say that we don't know exactly what Horace thought or the message he's trying to get across. But there is there's certainly evidence to suggest that Horace had a, a good amount of independence. And perhaps here he is reflecting the thoughts of some people in Rome and the empire about a sympathetic image of Cleopatra, more of a victim, perhaps. And this ties into Jenkins. And what Jenkins says is that actually they're not trying to create propaganda. They're just telling a story. They're just entertaining. They're not trying to provoke thought or political criticism. But she, intending to perish more nobly, showed no sign of womanish fear at the sword, nor did she even attempt to win with her speedy ships to some hidden shore. Again, we have the word nobly used linked to Cleopatra here. It's interesting in that second line where he talks of no sign of womanish fear at the sword. And that could be interpreted in two ways. It could be saying that she is brave, but it could also be playing back into what Wallace Hadrill was talking about, Roman values. You know, women were expected to behave in a particular way. And Cleopatra is in complete opposition of that. She doesn't even show womanish fear. You know, she gets drunk. She's an aggressor. She's everything against what female Romans should be like or Roman women whether they were classed as Romans, that's another question. So I think that is significant here. We have this sort of opposition to Roman values again. Um, and the fact that she is defeated, isn't she? Finally, here, she didn't even attempt to win. And that in turn implies Augustus's power, his victory, his military strength. And here the sympathetic image, imagery continues. And she dared to gaze at her fallen kingdom with a calm face and touch the poisonous asps with courage so that she might drink down their dark venom to the depths of her heart. So here we have a woman of courage, but notice how she's only portrayed in a positive way at the moment of her death. <laughs> we have descriptions of fallen kingdom, calm face. It's a quite a personal picture of Cleopatra here, isn't it, that Horace is painting. We're thinking about the woman, the queen, we're thinking about what she has lost. And actually, I think for those of you who are in year two, this really does have echoes, doesn't it, of the suicide of Dido in Virgil. And this, you know, you could very much use this as a comparison, either in an Aeneid essay, if you're talking about the sort of Roman purpose of Virgil, or in an imperial image essay. Growing fiercer still and resolving to die, scorning to be taken by hostile galleys, and no ordinary woman, yet queen no longer be led along in proud triumph. So this, this final image is really important because Horace very much intends it to be the final image of Cleopatra. So we have her calm in one verse, we have her um, resolving, but then we have the word scorning, fiercer, almost as if she's fighting against it. But the most important thing here is that she will not be led along in proud triumph. And that must have sort of grated not only on Augustus, but also on the whole of Rome, that they didn't get to see her paraded through the city in triumph, in that triple triumph. They only got to see an image of her and her children. So perhaps Horace is sort of referring to that feeling that we never got to see her, but actually maybe that reflects well on her and her nobility. 
Okay, so there is your summary of Cleopatra. Hopefully that helped. You got to take lots of notes. Remember, maybe go back through, think of some quotes that you want to learn. Maybe practice writing out those scholars and engaging with them. Maybe practice a 10 mark question on the language, thinking about the language and how Cleopatra is portrayed. Okay, thank you.